Okay, the 1960s. This is the decade where things start to get real. Um, let's just do a really quick recap and then we're going to get into it. So leading up into the 40s, we have all of these technological developments. So the wars created this opportunity for all these things to be invented. Those things were really abstract and meaning they weren't fully like being used. They were really expensive. And then they start to take shape in ways that people can actually get their hands on. This shows itself for sure in the 1950s, because in the 50s, we see this massive boom of an actual industry that forms the record industry. So we also see the like advent of rock and roll with Elvis. And we talked about all these different kinds of music that started to happen, all of these record labels that started to get created. And there was a business that started to form around it of an entertainment industry, right? And music was starting to get woven into our culture in a very substantial way. And I specifically mean recorded music and, and produced music. So that brings us to 1960. So there's going to be three main pillars we're going to talk about when we talk about 1960. First, the pillar of folk music. Now, the reason folk is so substantially important and impactful in this decade is that we start to see a shift. And let me explain. In the 1950s, this idea of like an entertainment industry, right, was... Um, flashy and it was this big show and dancing and lights and you know elvis was like a showman that was that was the whole thing right and obviously other other artists were happening as well maybe not all in that same showman capacity but they were definitely that was the majority and it was about like i keep bringing up this word music for the masses and one of the reasons i say music for the masses is that it was aimed at being kind of a pleasing experience, um, enjoying music and being a part of recorded music and playing these tunes and kind of setting the good vibes. It was all about making the experience very pleasing. And I've said this in the other videos, but there wasn't, even though people were saying things, there wasn't a lot of real things that were being said. There wasn't a lot of negative things that were being said. And music was really used as a tool for entertaining people and not so much as a form of communication in the way that maybe some art forms um, had been. Now, that brings us back to the folk music. The really, really impactful thing here is that artists stopped making it about the, the fancy lights and the big putting on a show and they started making it about what was the lyrics saying? What were the songs about? And this definitely couldn't be talked about without, I mean, there's obviously a whole bunch of folk artists out there that were popular, but the big one would be Bob Dylan. And if you don't know who Bob Dylan is, after this video, you need to go and look up Bob Dylan. But Bob Dylan was capable of writing incredibly impactful and powerful lyrics. And he performed them with an acoustic guitar, a harmonica, and his voice and he was able to say and do things with music that really had never been done to that level before now a lot of these songs would go on to impact um, the movements that were happening at the time so that's that's another thing we got to talk about because that's part of why this kind of culture or atmosphere was created because we had in the 50s we had the civil rights movement that kind of still continued on for decades to come and then we had the Vietnam War. And again, going back to these wars, there, there are these like major moments in our history. So we have to make sure we talk about how they're influencing our culture. And the Vietnam War was a really like controversial thing that was happening at the time. And certainly not all Bob Dylan songs were around the war, but they were about the kind of like tone that was in the air at the time. And these songs were like um, political protest songs and very incredibly powerful and we still use them all you know you hear them all the time still today even though like they were created in this kind of environment of, of turmoil so music starts to become a tool a very powerful tool to communicate 
very um, emotional ideas, and some of which, a lot of which, are not always pleasing ideas. This is a very substantial part of what the 60s start to look like with music. Next, we cannot talk about the 1960s without talking about rock, but specifically representing rock, the Beatles. Now, everybody should know who the Beatles are, but in case you don't, that's another one you gotta go look up, the Beatles. They start to take this shape um, between the early 60s when they start to get um, some of these like concepts were starting to form, they really take shape into the first, I would call them pop stars, pop icons. When I say pop, I mean like popular, right? And that's where we get the term pop music. Even though I'm categorizing under rock, that was the, the term at the time, but it really, they were larger than life. And they were becoming um, not just, they, they started over in Europe, in Britain, but they moved and their popularity shifted into a worldwide phenomenon. And there was a term that people would talk about and still do called Beatlemania. And it was literally like this craze that people were so into the Beatles that it was like a cultural like tsunami that hit. And music um, that they were making, it was technologically uh, doing something different in many ways and they were they were again they were saying really meaningful and powerful things with their lyrics their songs represented some really like amazing content some of which possibly being political but not maybe in the same way that Bob Dylan and, and others were doing it so it was like a, a contrasting element to this music that matters but also could reach a broader audience super uh, important to also note that one of the ways that the Beatles changed um, music from from there on out was that they were doing um, stuff with that multi-track recording on tape that no one had ever tried to do before and they actually developed certain recording processes throughout this decade that would change the way that we would record um, techniques for recording music from here on out and that's also part of why some of these records really stand the test of time because they were really like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like revolutionary in their approach. So obviously then we have the Beatles and then just to keep moving, and we have this other pillar which would really be more about planting seeds for future uh, decades, but Motown forms and starts to become something that happens in the 1960s in Detroit. and. Motown significantly you could look at one category that it would really fit which would be its rhythm and what those rhythms were doing at the time were different than any music that had been before it it was taking like that R&B we talked about it was taking jazz it was taking rock and it was taking all those and mashing them into something that would kind of turn into the first version of funk music and that is the seed that would grow into the tree of hip-hop and those rhythms would impact a culture for many decades that we that we still are impacted by so very very significant part of some of the music that was being made during the 60s now you all know me and you know that i could not justify talking about the 60s without also talking about the fact that in 1965 the first synthesizer was developed and sold. Now, the person who developed it was a guy named Bob Moog. And if you have been in my class and have watched the documentary about synthesizers, this is where things really start to shift because they talk about Moog, and we'll talk about that more um, in my classes from later on. But it's very significant to know that it was first released and, and sold and developed 1965. Then the other one that's going to be really important is the first record was put out, made exclusively on a synthesizer. And this record is actually kind of, it's interesting that it became such a, a staple and such a milestone for electronic music in particular because it was actually not original music. It was actually, um, it was it was made by a, a person, Wendy Carlos, and they went into the studio with this big Moog modular synthesizer, 
and they actually performed um, on two uh, keyboard pianos all music made by Bach and this was all very like classical traditional music but created with uh, electronic instrument and that had never been done before it was like mind-blowing for people and that record is still to this day one of the most popular uh, electronic records like from history and you'll find it in thrift stores and all sorts of record shops all over the time it it's just um it, it's like a household name all of a sudden that synthesizers could make this kind of music and so i'm going to say um we'll just say electronic e-record and this was substantial because then from here on out it was like whoa synthesizers aren't just for science labs and um making bleep bloop sounds they were actually making you know what people would think of formal music and that that's definitely something to be said because when you get people having that in their house and it starts to become a common thing then you have younger people who are going to see this and they're going to go oh my gosh this is possible now and they start to change their thinking so that in the 70s and the 80s synthesizers become like a phenomenon but it, it, we'll talk about that next week um, that's the substantial stuff from the 1960s. Obviously, as these decades keep going, um, things are going to get so much bigger and harder to condense down into small videos. But I'm doing my best to just do like a broad overview. So I missed a lot of stuff. I know um, if you have questions or comments that you want to add to things maybe that you uh, find in your research, feel free to add them to the comments. Otherwise, hope you have a great week. Bye bye.